Well, the great train robber Ronnie Biggs could soon be on the verge of being released from jail. Biggs, who is now 79, returned to the UK in 2001 after 30 years on the run. He wants to be freed before his 80th birthday, which uh, is this August, incidentally, on the anniversary of the great train robbery. Joining me now, Mike Gray, who's a friend of, the, uh, of Ronnie Biggs and wrote the inside story, which you were telling me had come out a bit earlier this year. Mike, do you yeah. think writing the book maybe sort of revived a bit of awareness of Ronnie and his story. I think definitely, Jeremy, it was brought about as an awareness campaign and uh, myself and Tel Curry, the publishers, we all got together. We, you know, I visit Ronnie every other month and it was just an awareness to let people know that he's still alive and he's still going through this high security madness. Um, I mean, what sort of shape's he in now? He's going to be 80 this summer. He's going to be 80 on August the 8th, the same anniversary of the Great Train Robbery. I visited him two weeks ago. He, he's very frail, very ill. I think the public will be very shocked when they actually see him come out the prison gates. And, I mean, I mean the, you know, a lot of people will say, well, look, he was involved in a, in a train robbery that at its time was the sort of biggest of its type, you know, two and a half million quid, which doesn't seem a lot now maybe, but in its time was huge. There was violence there, you know, one of the train employees was hurt and, you know, only fair he should finally do his time. Yeah, well, Ronnie knew as soon as he came back that he would be looking at three, five years maximum. But when he got to five though, Jeremy, we started scratching our heads thinking, well, how long is this going to go on for? Because he's now done his ten years and hopefully come July, August, he will be freed. Does he feel, do the people close to him feel that maybe sort of, you know, uh, being made to pay over the odds for the crime he committed? I, th I think so. At the end of the day, it was a crime directly on Her Majesty. It was her royal mail. And in those days, 1963, it was treason. Mm. And they were still hanging in 1963. It's an extraordinary thought, isn't it? it and of is. course, he went on the run, which made him even more notorious. Do you think he's, in a way, getting clobbered for that as well? Sort I th of. I think he is. People say 30 years in Brazil, the playboy life. But 30 years, Jeremy, he was a law-abiding citizen. And as a criminal, he couldn't earn a living. So he had to do these... Um, media circus acts to feed his, his food and for his son Michael. I'm intrigued to know, uh, Mike, how you sort of got interested and got in touch with him in the first place. Uh, I did a school project in 1974, whatever, and then in 1989 I actually wrote to him and, and got a reply because uh, I had all these newspaper cuttings and I've written to him every month since up until his 2001 return and I now visit him in Belmarsh Norwich Prison uh, every two months. When you say you wrote to him and got a reply, it wasn't that simple, I gather. It wasn't that simple. I wrote <laughs> uh, via a, new, a free newspaper in Rio asking for any press cuttings on Biggs and I'll send back anything as long as it's legal from the UK. As a result, I got a guy who was a Beatles collector <laughs> and he wanted uh, Thomas Tank Engine tapes because of Ringo Starr's voice. <laughs> so it's amazing that a connection through a train, although a caricature, got me in touch with Ronnie Biggs. And what fascinated you about it? I mean, as you say, you started as a schoolboy. Started as a school project, but in 1965, my father was a prison officer in Wandsworth, where Biggs escaped from. Uh, Although I was nine years old, yeah. it didn't mean anything to me at all. But in 74, when he was re-arrested, the school project, it all came back to me again. And, and here I am today, the book. <laughs> So you saw him, I mean, when you first uh, thought of it as a kid, I mean, was he a hero, a villain? I mean, what sort of character did you have in your mind before you actually got round to meeting him? That he was uh, a quite famous villain, obviously, because of the great <laughs> train robbery. Yeah, in 1970, he, yeah. Yeah, he obviously was. He, he was still wanted. No one knew where he was. And then, and then he resurfaced. And what did, I mean, when you got to meet him, and you now meet him, as you say, every month, I mean, what have you made of him? What sort of character? He's just an innocent old man. His criminal CV, Jeremy, before the train robbery, as one detective put it to me, laughable. He'd never been involved in anything as a large major crime. And all the train robbers, 16 of them, voted 15 to 1 not to have him involved. They couldn't trust him. But because Bruce Reynolds, his friend from Borstal, was the organiser, he said, Ronnie's in on the train robbery. And in the end, what sort of role did he play in it that he's, in the end, become so notorious for? Ronnie was the T-boy, as I say, and the guy couldn't drive the train because the vacuum had changed. So Ronnie and this other guy sat on the embankment. Ronnie didn't set foot on the train. He knew nothing about what happened to the driver. And when they got back to the farmhouse, a big hole was dug in the back garden. And in Ronnie's own words, he thought that was for him and the driver. <laughs> really? Because, oh, really? Because the other robbers, with all this, like you say, all the millions, they couldn't trust him. Did he get actually much out of it in the end, out of that two and a half million? Uh, the money that Ronnie got obviously went through guys getting him out of the prison, 
getting him out of the country and his plastic surgery. Because uh, when he landed in Australia in 1970, um, he, he looked the same, so his wife said, and he was penniless. <laughs> so he went back to his old career of being a, journ um, a carpenter, yeah. and, you know, settled down, got a house, family, and then just through photographs being shown in the UK, someone recognised him who he worked for. I mean, most people of a generation will, will never forget the name Ronnie Biggs, and yet, as you say, he was a sort of bit of a loser before he got this notoriety. I yes. mean, as an old man, if he, when he finally does get out, one assumes he may well do in the next few weeks. I mean, what could he look forward to really now? I think Ronnie's main wish was not to die in prison, to die on the outside with his family that love him so much and close family friends. You know, I mean, you can't get more of a loving son than Michael, really what he's gone through himself. Extraordinary story. Mike Gray, thanks for uh, shedding a bit of light and Thank you very much. reminding those who haven't heard about him. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much, Thank Mike you. Gray, and uh, he's written a book about Ronnie Biggs there. Now, let's have a look at some of the...